Okay, okay. Hi. Welcome to class. This is chapter 6 of Sensation and Perception. We are talking about color perception. So let's kick it off with an overview. Some aspects of color perception are bottom-up, varying wavelength intensities of different cone receptors, opponent process mechanisms in retinal ganglion cells. As long as light comes into the eyes and the cone receptors are working, they will pick up signals. And beyond the retina, we find lots of bottom-up processes. Other aspects are top-down, right? The influence of background content context on color perception of objects. Consider the context that we see an object in. All right, this may be why some people see a certain color one way, and then other people see that color another way. There are also lots of unknowns, right? We do not know everything about how we see color, and there are individual differences to consider. People's retinae are different, and this may impact how they see color. Also, quick note here is that the way people learn and understand colors may affect how they see them. Two, wavelengths of light and color. Visible light consists of different physical wavelengths that we perceive as color. The visible spectrum is a band of wavelengths from 400 to 700 nanometers that people with the most common classes of cone vision can detect. Heterochromatic light is just white light, consisting of many wavelengths. All right, many artificial sources of light are mixes of multiple wavelengths that can be classified as white light. Normal incandescent light bulbs tend to emit more long wavelength light, making them yellowish. Fluorescent light bulbs tend to emit shorter wavelengths, making them blue. Ooh, and a little fun fact here is that there are interesting peaks in fluorescent bulbs, which are very strong in the blue and green range, whereas incandescent light bulbs show a gradual increase, right, peaking in the longer red wavelengths. LEDs have a range of wavelengths that are emitted. Some can emit ultraviolet, others can emit longer wavelengths, so there are all kinds of possibilities that LEDs can emit, depending on their material or how big they are. Monochromatic light, then, is just light consisting of one wavelength. All right, 500 nanometers is monochromatic light, which is somewhat greenish. And then we have spectral reflectance. All right, this is the ratio of light reflected by an object at each wavelength. Quick note here is that in many environments, we are not seeing direct light. I mean, for example, look at the desk. There is no direct light coming from the desk, but rather light being reflected off of the desk. So the question is, what wavelengths are getting reflected off of a particular object? Most objects just reflect light back into your eyes. Even objects that are white will change the way they look depending on how much light is being reflected off of them. Three, hue, saturation, lightness, and brightness. There are a number of terms that describe the aspects of color. Hue is the quality of light, corresponding to the color names that we use, like orange, green, indigo, and cyan. Hue is just the quality of color. Quality, then, is a value that changes, but does not make the value larger or smaller. That's why hue is the quality of color. Saturation, then, is the purity of light, so less saturated images have more white light mixed in. The more saturated the stimulus, the stronger the color experience will be. And the less saturated the stimulus is, the more it appears white or gray or black, or achromatic. More saturation, stronger color experience. Less saturation, weaker color experience. Brightness is the perceived intensity of the light present. So the brighter an object is, the easier it is to see, and the more noticeable the colors are. So yes, colors are easier to see as intensity increases. Lightness is the psychological experience of the amount of light that gets reflected by a surface. This is a different property than the amount of light present. Brightness usually applies to colors, whereas lightness usually refers to the white-gray-black continuum. So, lightness is all about grayscale objects, or objects that vary from black to white. 4. Achromatic lightness means that all wavelengths are reflected. When objects reflect all light wavelengths equally, they are said to be achromatic. So, there may be no differences in the reflectivity of wavelengths. However, a white square reflects most light that shines on it, a gray square reflects about half of the light that shines on it, and a black square absorbs most of the light that shines on it. Ooh, and a little fun fact here is that all wavelengths reflected in grayscale will reflect more light than something reflected in darkscale. 5. 
Additive and Subtractive Color Mixing Colors can be created through additive and subtractive color mixing. Additive color mixing is the creation of a new color by a process that adds one set of wavelengths to another set of wavelengths. Example, when we add all different wavelengths of sunlight, we see white light rather than any individual colors. This is called additive because all of the wavelengths still reach our eyes. In other words, additive color mixing is all about adding a new set of wavelengths to an existing color patch, or basically, mixing lights. It is the combination of different wavelengths that creates the diversity of color. Also, from class, right, mixing lights is how color is created on our phones. Right? Each pixel is a liquid crystal display, but we do not see the individual pixels. This can also happen with artwork. Think of pointillism, a bunch of dots creating a scene. We'll get to this later. And on the flip side is subtractive color mixing. Subtractive color mixing is color mixing in which a new color is made by the removal of wavelengths from a light with a broad spectrum of wavelengths. Subtractive color mixing occurs when we mix paints, dyes, or pigments. When we mix paints, both paints still absorb all of the wavelengths they did previously. So what we are left with is only the wavelengths that both paints reflect. For example, mixing yellow and cyan creates red, because the only wavelength that reflects back is red, while the other wavelengths fall by the wayside. Or, another example, combining cyan, yellow, and magenta creates black, because no wavelengths are being reflected back into our eye. In other words, subtractive color mixing is all about removing a set of wavelengths, or just having a lone wavelength. This is called subtractive mixing because when the paints mix, wavelengths are deleted from what we see because each paint will absorb some wavelengths that the other paint reflects, thus leaving us with a smaller number of wavelengths remaining afterwards. So, basically, some wavelengths will not be reflected after the mix. Important. A way to remember the difference between additive and subtractive color mixing is that additive color mixing is what happens when we mix lights of different colors, whereas subtractive color mixing occurs when we mix paints or other colored materials. And a little fun fact is that if you combine all the primary wavelengths, you will get white light. With additive color, you will ultimately get white, all colors together. With subtractive color, you will ultimately get black, the absence of color. Number six, additive color mixing, mixing lights. Yes, we're getting into pointillism. All right, in pointillism, an artist uses small distinct dots of simple primary colors as the basis of a painting, using small dots of color to form bigger images. From a distance, the dots of colors blend together through a process similar to additive color mixing to form a rich array of colors. So the dots may be of very few primary colors, but when seen from a distance, the colors form an additive mixture, and we see a richer array of colors. Also, a quick note here is that the colors are created not by mixing paints, but by keeping each dot a specific color, so that the dots blend together in a person's vision when viewed from a distance. That's where the magic happens. Seven. Subtractive color mixing. Mixing paints. Subtractive color mixing is more common in the natural world. There are more situations in which pigments on the surfaces of objects interact than situations in which lights interact. Outside of artificial lighting, all lighting in nature comes from the sun and is therefore white light, not monochromatic light. Subtractive color mixing occurs when we mix substances with different absorption spectra. For example, when green paint is applied to the pink wall, the green paint continues to absorb most wavelengths other than green, and to some extent, close by colors such as yellow. The pink paint continues to absorb most wavelengths other than red, and to some extent, close by colors such as yellow. Therefore, when the first coat of green paint is put on the wall, the net result may be a yellow color. So, when we mix substances, the mixture will absorb the wavelengths both substances absorb, leaving only the wavelengths that neither one absorbs left reflecting. Right, number eight, color matching experiments. We can assess how people match colors using a metameric matching experiment. A metamer is a psychophysical color match between two patches of light that have different sets of wavelengths. Or, in other words, a metamer is just two patches that participants perceive as having the same color. The metameric matching experiment goes like this. The participant in a metameric matching study is shown a test patch of monochromatic light. 
the participant has control over three primary lights in the comparison patch. They must adjust the intensity of each of the primary lights until the mix of the three lights looks subjectively identical to the monochromatic test patch. The patches in a metameric matching experiment have different color distributions, like matching a monochromatic color patch to a patch composed of multiple wavelengths. This can help explain why an object looks different under different lighting conditions. Like when we purchase clothing in the store and then it looks different at home. Most of the time, under natural lighting conditions, these types of situations would not occur because color constancy is more the rule in nature. Fun fact, an interesting phenomenon is memory color. It's similar to cognitive penetration. If shown a picture of a banana in a grayscale image, Participants will adjust the color to match the gray one, and the adjusted color will have a slightly yellowish tint. An even stronger example is when a gray banana is shown next to a blue banana. The gray one is perceived as slightly yellow, and the blue one is perceived as gray. Its color moves, right? Because you know banana is yellow. So TLDR, in the metameric matching experiment, you have a test patch, which is a single wavelength, then you are presented with a comparison patch that is a blend of different wavelengths, and you have to alter the wavelengths of the comparison patch until it matches the test patch. Nine. The retina and color. Cone receptors have variable sensitivities to different wavelengths. S cones. The cone with its peak sensitivity in short wavelength light, or color blue. Basically, the S cone absorbs all the energy at 420 nanometers. Lower percentage in the fovea, though. The M cone. The cone with its peak sensitivity to medium wavelength light, around 535 nanometers, or green. Basically, the M cone absorbs all the energy at 565 nanometers. And last but not least, the L cone. The cone with its peak sensitivity to long wavelength light around 565 nanometers, or yellow. The L cone absorbs all the energy at 565 nanometers. The sensitivities to the S, M, and L cones are given as a function of their response sensitivities to light of different wavelengths. An object's color is determined by the joint response of each cone in response to that object's reflected wavelength pattern. So, the perception of color is based on how each cone responds. The peaks indicate the cone's sensitivity. Also, quick note here is that the rods are monochromatic, or not sensitive to color, but they do have a peak because, even though they don't really care about color, they do still have a sort of sensitivity. So, yes, rods do have a peak. Also, an object's color is determined by the joint response of each cone in response to that object's reflected wavelength pattern. Any given cone system, by itself, cannot determine wavelength, and therefore cannot determine color. At least two cone types are necessary for any color vision to occur. Ooh, and a little fun fact here is that there is individual variation in the distribution of the three cone types in the retina. Oh, and to further complicate things, we constantly move our eyes, and most often our head and body is in motion and this all changes the distribution of light across the receptors. Integration of this array of changing light occurs at levels beyond the retina, to give us not only a stable perception of the world, but also relatively stable color perception of specific objects in the present context. So, TLDR, roughly speaking, we can associate certain colors with certain cones, but really the cones do work together to influence our perception of color. Okay, so some female humans have a fourth cone type, True tetrachromacy is rare, probably less than one in a thousand human females. Ah, ten. Retina is bottom-up. The retina does initial color processing in a bottom-up fashion, so just think of what happens in the retina as being bottom-up. Each cone system responds to a 500 nanometer light, but with a weaker or stronger response. Color is partially determined by this pattern of responses of each cone to any particular wavelength. When a wavelength of light is presented to the visual system, all three cones do respond, yet we still think of each cone claiming one color because the distribution of responses is what distinguishes one cone's claim on a color from the others. And you can see here that the middle cones have a very strong claim to the color green, whereas the long and the short, they can't stack up. So that's why we're like, oh yeah, middle cones, they get green, because just look at the strength of that response, even though really, 
All the cones do respond, they're just not all the same strength. 11. Univariance. More than one receptor is necessary to see color. This is the concept of univariance. Univariance is just the principle whereby any single cone system is colorblind, in the sense that different combinations of wavelengths and intensity can result in the same response from the cone system. So, in other words, people with only one cone type are colorblind, because we need different combinations of different wavelengths and intensities. No individual cone system can, by itself, distinguish colors. Also, univariance explains why colors are not seen at night, because when under scotopic conditions, or dim light, only the rod system is used. Because there is only one class of rods, no color is seen under these conditions. So, TLDR, univariance is just any single cone system is colorblind. Different combinations of wavelength and intensity can result in the same response from the cone system. Number 12, trichromatic theory of color vision. All right, the trichromatic theory of color vision is based on the variable responses of cone receptors. Trichromatic theory of color vision is just the theory that the color of any light is determined by the output of the three cone systems in our retina. This theory was developed by Thomas Young and Hermann von Helmholtz. This theory was a precursor to the modern view of color vision, in which the S, M, and L cones essentially serve as a trichromatic system which we talked about earlier with which colors they are most sensitive to. On the flip side, we have number 13, which is the opponent process theory of color perception. Herring proposed the opponent process theory, which involves processing in the retinal ganglion cells. Opponent process theory of color perception is just the theory that color perception arises from three opponent mechanisms. For red, the opponent is green. For blue, the opponent is yellow. And for black, the opponent is white. Herring developed his theory by observing how people arranged and sorted colors. The theory says that four primaries compose color vision. They are organized into two sets of oppositional pairs. Blue-yellow are opposites, and red-green are opposites. This is also bottom-up, technically, since this is occurring relatively early in the visual system. Also, a quick note here is that in retinal ganglion cells, we do find opponent process cells. Retinal ganglion cells have a center surround receptive field. Some sensory input in the center may show a sort of color opponency, wherein if a red dot is shown in the center, you get a big splurge of red in the system. But when green is shown in the outside, right in the surround, then you get a shutdown of the green system. So basically, you can excite the red channel, or inhibit the green channel. Cone opponent cells, neurons that are excited by the input from one cone type in the center, but inhibited by the input from another cone type in the surround. Color opponent cells, neurons that are excited by one color in the center and inhibited by another color in the surround, or neurons that are inhibited by one color in the center and excited by another color in the surround. Fun fact here is that there are also double opponent cells that help detect color boundaries. Double opponent cells are cells that have a center which is excited by one color and inhibited by the other. In the surround, the pattern is reversed. So TLDR, like center surround cells, there are color opponent cells. Ones that, for example, might become most active when red is in the center of the cell's receptive field and when green is in the surround. Number 14, talking about support for the opponent process theory. A number of findings support Herring's opponent process theory, including after images and simultaneous color contrast. After images are visual images that are seen after an active stimulus has been removed. An after image is seen as the complementary color, colors on the opposite side of the color wheel. When mixed together in equal intensity, you get a white or a gray or a black color. Important, complementary colors are not the same as an opponent color. Red and green are opponent colors, but because you get yellow when you add them together, they are not complements. In order to be complements when added together, you gotta get white or gray or black. After images lead to complementary colors, which support opponent process theory. 
And then we have simultaneous color contrast, a phenomenon that occurs when our perception of one color is affected by a color that surrounds it. A change in a color's appearance by surrounding it with its opponent, so you can enhance redness by surrounding red with green. Opponent colors can enhance the experience of each other. A green square surrounded by red looks more green than if surrounded by a neutral color. Similarly, a yellow square looks more yellow when surrounded by a blue background than a neutral background. Quick note here is that simultaneous color contrast may also have higher level effects beyond the retinal ganglion cells. <sighs> Number 15. The development of color perception. Infants are born with all three cone types. They have the early part of the visual system at birth. Fun fact, infants' cones are scattered randomly in the retina. So, cone migration happens, where all the cones move towards the center of the retina. Infants seem to perceive changes in wavelength, similar to adults. We study infant behavior to understand how they see the world. There are some vocab terms attached to this stuff, which we'll cover now. Habituation is the learning process in which animals stop responding to a repeated stimulus. And then, the flip side, dishabituation, is the process in which, after habituation has occurred, changing the stimulus causes the organism to respond again. Or, in other words, dishabituation is just a sudden interest in something that has been changed only slightly. And this shows that infants can notice that something very small has changed. In the study, Bornstein and co. used dishabituation to examine color perception in four-month-old infants. They wanted to see if these infants would notice that something a little greenish would change to be a little bluish. The question ultimately becomes, do infants see these colors in the same way that adults do? If they do, then the infants should show much stronger dishabituation to the 480 nanometer stimulus than to the 540 nanometer stimulus. And that is exactly what Bornstein and colleagues found. Infants gave responses that suggest that they have similar color distinctions to adults, and infants have operating cones and opponent processes for color vision already operating. So, TLDR, to determine the presence of color vision, Bornstein and co. observed infant response to color stimuli through processes of habituation and dishabituation. 16. Aging and color perception. Color vision changes as we age. The lens will normally become less clear, so it becomes harder for light to pass through the eyes. So yes, lens transparency changes with age. The lens loses transparency to short wavelengths more than others, decreasing the ability to see blue. The loss of the sensitivity to blue is slow and usually unnoticed. If an individual receives an artificial lens, changes become noticeable, as typically eyes are operated one at a time. The eye with the implanted lens gives the individual clear transmission of short wavelengths, making the distinction between the new lens and the unchanged eye very clear. So basically, if both my eyes have grown tired of seeing blue, and I've just not even noticed that I don't see blue anymore, giving me a new eye suddenly makes me realize, wow, my eyes really don't see blue. Losing transparency to short wavelengths results in an increase in confusion of blues and yellows. This is explained by opponent process theory. This is just basically that color perception arises from the opponent mechanisms, red, green, blue, yellow, black, white. So of course, if you cannot see blue as well, you're gonna get it confused with its opponent, that being yellow. Evidence for this theory comes from color after images and hue cancellation studies. Neuroscience has also shown that there are cone opponent cells in the LGN, or lateral geniculate nucleus, and color opponent cells in V1. In particular, double opponent cells seem to be specialized for detecting edges, where one color ends and another color starts. <sighs> Number 17. Talking about color deficiency. Color deficiency is a more accurate term than color blindness. Color deficiency is the condition of individuals who are missing one or more of their cone systems. Important, color deficient individuals are not colorblind. 
they just see fewer colors than trichromatic individuals. Color deficiency is a result of genetic variations that prevent the development of one or more cone systems. It is generally present at birth, and it is much more common in men. Well, 5 to 10 percent more common in men than women. Fun fact, dogs and cats are probably color deficient. Probably. Number 18, types of color deficiency. We have rod monochromacy, cone monochromacy, dichromacy, and cortical achromatopsia. Starting with rod monochromacy, this is when you have only rods, okay? Only rods, no cones, this is extremely rare. Then, cone monochromacy is also pretty rare. This is where you have only one cone type. And a quick note here is that having only one cone, as in cone monochromacy, or having no cones, as in rod monochromacy, makes you see the world completely in grayscale. When it comes to this, you are completely color deficient, or basically, you're colorblind. Dichromacy is more common. All right, this is where two out of the three cone types are present. There are different variations of dichromacy. All right, we have protonopia, dirtanopia, and tritonopia. All right, so starting with protonopia, this is a lack of L cones, leading to red-green deficiency. This trait is sex-linked, and so it is more common in men. Protonopia, no red colors. The world looks kind of bluish, greenish, yellowish. And then, dirtanopia is a lack of M cones, leading to a red-green deficiency. All right, this trait is also sex-linked, and again, more common in men. This makes the world look very similar to what we saw with protonopes, with the bluish, greenish, yellowish tint going on. Third and final, we have tritonopia. This is a lack of S cones, leading to blue-yellow color deficiency. Now, important to note, Tritonopia is more rare, and it is not sex-linked, all right? The world looks kind of bluish. The loss of the short wavelengths eliminates the middlemost wavelengths, like green. So people may perceive some colors as blue, even though they lack S-cones. Protonopia, lack of L-cones. Duritonopia, lack of M-cones. Tritonopia, lack of S-cones. I hope I'm pronouncing those right. If not, too bad. Then we have cortical achromatopsia. All right, this can occur from damage to the occipital lobe, specifically area V4. Some patients can still discriminate by wavelength even though they do not experience the colors. These patients still have all of their cone systems intact, and the problem is at a higher level of processing. This may be why they can discriminate between wavelengths, but still not see color. Also, in some cases, Patients with achromatopsia lose their ability to remember color. In contrast, people who become colorblind because of eye damage still remember the experience of color. Also, quick note here is that in some cases, patients with cortical achromatopsia can no longer put color into mental images and so may fail to remember objects by their colors. Even in memory, these objects lose their colors. So, a banana is no longer yellow in memory, a tomato is no longer red, etc. Finally, in some cases, individuals may not even be aware that color vision has been lost. Again, all of this symptomatology has been linked to damage in V4. Ah, number 19, the Ishihara Plate. The Ishihara plate is used to determine color deficiency. The dots are all the same brightness, so only the color is different. Only color allows you to see the number. So, for the plate shown, somebody who is red-green color deficient would not be able to see the number. This is why they're good at determining color deficiency. Number 20 is just different types of color vision, so this is just a chart going over all the different types. Anomalous trichromacy is a condition in which all three cone systems are intact, but one or more has an altered absorption pattern, leading to different metameric matches than in the most common type of trichromatic individuals. 21 just goes over some stats on the different anomalous color deficiencies. Protonopia and duratinopia are linked to the X chromosome, therefore they are inheritable and more common in men than women, and there is a quick tangent on genetics, you can read it if you want, 
We didn't go over it too much in class, but I pulled it right from the book. It's there if you need it. Have a go if you like. We're moving on now to number 22, constancy. Lightness and color, constancy. All right, color is a thing wherein the perspective of an object's color remains constant even under different lighting conditions. Or basically, a red bag in a dim room still looks just as red to us as it did in a bright room. Constancy, then, is the ability to perceive an object as the same under different conditions. But there are exceptions. For example, an artist painting at dusk may notice that the light makes the tree leaves look more yellow than green. Lightness constancy works similarly. A piece of paper under a projector still looks white to us, just as it does in a room that is much dimmer than the projector light. Lightness constancy is just the ability to perceive the relative reflectance of objects despite changes in illumination. In other words, the relative reflectance of objects is the same despite changes in illumination. So, think of it along the continuum from black to gray to white. Color constancy, then, is the ability to perceive the color of an object despite changes in the amount and nature of illumination. Or, in other words, the color of an object is seen as the same despite changes in illumination. For example, we see a monument as being the same color despite changes in illumination from day to night, which is what we see in those pictures on the previous page. Last but not least, number 23, talking about the Gleb effect. All right, there are some interesting illusions resulting from lightness constancy, such as the Gleb effect. The Gleb effect is a phenomenon whereby an intensely lit black object appears to be gray or white in a homogeneously dark space. We assume that there is a light source that casts a shadow over B, putting it in darker light than A. In the whole context, the squares appear to be nearly the same shade. We think that this illusion is made possible by the assumptions that we make in the brain. Basically, we see square A as being the same shade as B, even though objectively, B is darker than A because the brain sees this and it's just like, oh yeah, there's a shadow over B, but if the shadow wasn't there, surely it would be the same shade as A, even though what we're seeing is that B is darker than A. The brain is just like, oh, well, there's a shadow over it. If you took that away, it'd be the same shade. And the brain does this automatically. We don't really need to put too much thought into it. And over-explaining it is kind of like over-explaining the joke where it loses all of its funny. Okay, that is gonna do it for chapter six, color perception. This has been fun. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.